So hi everyone, and I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit more about myself. So my name is Griselda Cuevas, Gris, short, and I am an open source strategist at Google, which makes me a Googler, which basically means that I am a Doogler mom to this guy. His name is Brody, and he's a two-year-old boxer, and he's my puppy. So. I am actually joined on stage also by Boo, who uh, is another Googler with the little batch here. I love that. So yeah, being a Googler means you get to hang out with Googlers. Uh, some fun facts about myself. Uh, I've worked in 11 countries, and those 11 countries don't include Mexico, which is my, my city of origin where I was born. Um, I'm also a diversity and inclusion advocate. I work uh, on bringing more diversity and inclusion to the open source community specifically. And I love wine and going to the gym because I love wine. <laughs> so those are like three fun facts about myself. And today I'm going to talk about non-code contributions and why they matter in open source. So about this talk, this is the outline in which I'm going to um, walk you through, through the content. So first I'm going to talk about why non-code contributions, NCC, matter to open source. Then I'm going to discuss a few of the models and types of non-code contributions. And I'm going to talk about how these non-code contributions add value to the open source projects. After that, I'm going to talk about how can we recognize the non-code contributions in our projects and also about the challenges of actually getting to recognize them or identify them. So to get things started, I would love to do a little dynamic here. How would you feel if you were in this situation? Let's see, like just hear from the audience. Excited, Excited. Excited. terrified. What else? Worried. Worried. Nauseous? <laughs> Inspired, yes. Well, all of those feelings are very similar to what new users and contributors feel whenever they are trying to approach uh, your open source project. I don't know if this, uh, if we have issues with the screen, but let me know if we need to adjust something. So yes, new users and contributors have exact all those feelings when they are trying to approach your project. And Non-code contributions matter because they provide a stability and they are that bridge that help users and contributors decide to get approached to your project. So non-code contributions provide a stability and increase the project value and also the perception that people see from, from the outside to your project. So what are the different types of non-code contributions? Non-code contributions serve three purposes. The first one is to help you with user management. This is the outward looking, the outward uh, facing or looking part of the non-code contributions on the management of a project. This is like the gate to your project. This is how you help others see you from outside. They also help you with project management. And project management is more inward looking. It's more about like helping you guide and do all the necessary mechanics to continue to produce the technology that creates your open source project. Then we also have community management, which is a little bit of inward looking and outward looking because it's connecting all the different participa participants or stakeholders in your project. So these three types of uh, of like classifying the different non-code contributions help you understand what is it, where they add value or how they interact with your project. So now let me give you a few examples of each type. So for user management, we have uh, documentation. So why is documentation helping you manage users? Documentation is the landing for everyone who's interested in either using your, your technology or contributing to it. For project management, ticket triage. That is very critical if you don't do like triage of like all the different issues that you have either in your Jira or GitHub. You don't know how to prioritize the work that the community is doing to add value to the technology. And then for community management, meetups. Meetups are very important because they actually bring together your community and provide that opportunity for folks to interact face to face. And creating that, that opportunity to manage all the different efforts that they, they will do and work together. 
There are also some examples of not con contributions that touch more than one of these types. So let me give you an example of those. So there are, there are uh, non code contributions that actually touch um, user management and project management. That is release, um, release announcements. So every time that you have a new version of the project, if there is not an announcement that lets your users know about it or your contributors about it, you're not going to engage with people that are like already in the community at the right time. Then there's also uh, activities that overlap between user management and community management, like Stack Overflow answers. So those touch those two points because it's pretty much doing community management through the, the like helping users understand how to use your technology and also solve issues that they might have. And then there are activities that sit on the, over, on the intersection of project management and community management, like bug reporting. If you don't have feedback from your, your community and to your project, you're never going to know how to improve or what are the things that are not working like, as intended or ideally for your community. And lastly, there are no code contributions that sit in the intersection of the three types. And an example of that will be conferences. Conferences actually help you do user management because people interested in your technology will attend to listen uh, use cases and hear how others use your technology. And they will also help you do community management. There's going to be a great opportunity like today to meet people that otherwise you wouldn't see in person or actually have in like real time conversations. And they will help also do project management. If you, if you want to work like in a, in a sprint or a hackathon, these are great opportunities to do that. So now that we, that we have covered like these three models and how like non-code contributions can overlap the different stakeholders or the different models of, of the contributions, I'm going to tell you how they provide value and how can you measure this. And before doing that, another thing that I wanted to do is like just continue to give you an extensive list of examples just to continue to help you think through the type of activities that either your contributors or your community might be doing that are no contributions to your project. So the list in user management, there are things like documentation, answering questions, cookbooks, UX design. And UX design is either the graphic design that you use in your landing page to actually having flows that help people access the documentation and, and everything that you need to know about your technology. And then there's also like use case marketing and, and so on. In community management, we have things like the events, hackathons, we have mentorships, news feeds, newsletters. Uh, we have fundraising as well, which is a very important part for projects that are not uh, completely backed up by commercial vendors. And in the project management side, I think that this is the model or the type of non code contributions that are more like are closer to, to developers and to actually cut contributors because they are needed. Otherwise, you are not like producing the technology. And these are related to release management, Jira management, the feature, um, the feature triage that we were talking about. We also have roadmaps. Some projects like doing roadmaps, some projects don't like doing roadmaps, but they are essentially deciding what the community is going to work on or it's going to push forward. We have testing, which is very important, and we also have quality insurance, which is like once the release are out, who's going to be monitoring bugs coming up and who's going to be actually following up that uh, these bugs aren't affecting like major users and major parts of the, of the project. So with that, now I'm going to like talk about how to actually grasp the value of these con contributions. So node con contributions add value in two main areas. One is development sustainability. And development sustainability talks about how the development gets into like, the right cadence to continue to develop value into a project, even how a project moves through their life cycle from being maybe an idea, then a more robust project, going into incubation through one of the foundations, or actually building the, the entire ecosystem of open source around it. And also, like, how do you mature the technology that you open source? And then you have ecosystem growth. Ecosystem growth talks about what is the pie size, the market that you're enabling with that technology. 
We know that open source is actually an economic model that allows software, like, uh, software usage for commercial vendors to build like, a commercial offering of the technology, but also to enable research, enable innovation, and creating more value in, in, in the technology space. So now I'm gonna talk about why each of these two areas of providing value into your product are important. And the objective of doing this is to help you identify why this is important for your project. Projects that are in different, in different stages in the life cycle might need different type of non-code contributions. And one of these two areas might be more important than the other one. For example, for a, like, brand new project, it might be more important to reach development and stability first, to grow the number of users that we have, the number of contributors that we have, and actually help it growth. But for other projects more mature, it might be more important to develop the ecosystem and create new market opportunities. For example, one of the, uh, the use cases that I have talked to people at different events is how do we bring uh, big data and machine learning technologies to markets like Latin America, where it hasn't been completely like open up to, to, to companies and developers there. So let's talk about development sustainability. Development sustainability is a measurement of efficiency for your project and at the same time of a stability. And the units that you put against this is hours, is time. And time can be either the time that you spend developing, developing the technology, for example, release cycles. If your release cycle goes anywhere from like two months to six months, is that healthy? Does that help grow your user base? Is that the right time uh, for everybody in, in your stakeholder map? Or is maybe too long? Um, time can also be the time that you save people by refactoring the same thing. So one of the things of open source is that actually you want to bring players in the industry, not reinventing the wheel every time. So you can measure how much time do you save by bringing people together and avoiding rework, or people working in similar things that are not communicating to each other. What is the impact of development sustainability? You have agility in development, so the more you are working towards this, you have a more organized community of, development, uh, of developers, and you're helping your technology evolve at a much better pace. You also have a scalability. scalability. Scalability means that you have the uh, you have the infrastructure to make your technology grow faster, and you don't need to be like patching everything and just starting from from the ground up. And you have reliability. The more mature the technology is, the less like the less likely you're going to have bugs or failures, or you're going to have like all the awful things and long nights that nobody really wants to spend in open source. So those, those are the, the important pieces that you need to look for. So why am I giving you units and impact? Because it's important that you take a step uh, back and think about what the work of all, everybody in your community is helping you achieve. Is a better piece of documentation helping you avoid a lot of errors that users have and a lot of time that people are spending opening tickets Consolidated in tickets that are about the same thing. This type of uh, this type of like process thought will help you give better recognition to the people who actually spend time doing this. The second the second piece is ecosystem growth. So we talk about the time, either savings or efficiency. Now we're going to talk about the money. So when you grow the ecosystem. It's basically that uh, like concept of growing the pie for everyone doing open source. And the units is that, it's just money. Um, I was just recently reading a study on the market size for Spark and how it has been growing ever since the inception of the project. And how much is it expected to grow again in Latin America because that's a market that I'm trying to bring more awareness in, in the industry. And what is the impact of actually paying attention to the market size growth? Is you, you focus on bringing more adoption of communities that are not necessarily represented in your current community. You, you have like a more mature group that can organize themselves better. 
and you can still do better features by understanding needs of different users. For example, somebody was telling me that uh, one of the reasons why um, big data and machine learning hasn't really taken off in other countries is because connectivity is also an issue. So if you don't take into account that by not including those users, you're never going to mature your technology, technology to also serve those folks. And lastly, the more you adapt to these markets, the more money it's going to be on the table for everybody working in the, in the project. So again, if we think about how non-code contributions help in this, in this area, we can think about, I'm going to tell you the story that happened with Apache Beam, which is one of the projects I contribute to. In 2016, we took a workshop about Apache Beam to Mexico. And a few months later, a friend of mine who is in the VC world, the venture capital uh, industry in Mexico, came to me and asked me about this Apache Beam technology because he had heard that it's hot and coming. And I asked him, how did you hear about that? And he told me, like, somebody gave a talk about it. And it turned out that the person who gave talk was a person who came to our workshop. So this is how you can see that by somebody doing advocacy or meetups actually planted the seed for someone who invents, invests money to believe in the technology and thus grow the brand of your project. So now that we talk about how non-code contributions actually add value to your project, let's talk about how we recognize them. And this is a topic that it was very interesting to me since the beginning. I got very excited when this morning Isabel in the keynote was talking about how to do this in the projects. So let's, let's cover a few points here. So I wanted to share this. This is a screenshot of Leah Cole, who's also a colleague of mine, Google. She is sharing her excitement about the Apache Airflow community recognizing her first contribution. And what I really like about this tweet is what she said at the end. So there is no contribution that is too small. And that is true. So if you can see here in the, in the tweet what, let me just go one back. She was saying that the only thing she did was to change one line of code, uh, one line of documentation, sorry. But that line of documentation like, made her spend a lot of time trying to figure out the technology. So this is the, the impact or the value that she added. By just changing one line of documentation, she's going to vote uh, probably thousands of users falling into the same loophole she was, she's going to help them prevent that same experience. So with this, this uh, an anecdote that I'm sharing with Leah's permission, I want to talk about three things that you can do to, to have more Leah's in your community. Recognize early. So just as Isabel said uh, this morning, just by a public thank you or Something else that, that we talk about a lot with Holden is when you are reviewing PRs, something that you can do to recognize someone who is doing their first small contribution is don't let a PR sit there for six months. At least just acknowledge the fact that the PR arrived and maybe providing a, a time frame in which you're going to review it is doing this, recognizing the contribution early. And yeah, so basically it it's not only saying thank you, it's even just acknowledging that people are contributing it. The second point is reward consistency. So there's going to be a lot of people who are going to arrive to your project and are going to do small contribution, contributions, which is fine. But if somebody is doing it consistently, that person should be rewarded. And a way to reward it, as Isabel said in this morning too, it could, it could range from send chocolate or give that person a chocolate in the next conference you, you find them. Or help them move through the funnel of contributing to your project. Help that person become a committer in the Apache Server Foundation terms. Or be part of the maintainers community. If you give that recognition, you are also building your community funnel, which is very important for your project. And the third thing that you can do is Build and empower a network. Recognizing non-con contributions cannot be done just by one person or by a few people. And this is something that I'm also going to cover in the challenges. But if you have more, more people looking into this, you're going to be doing more of non-con contribution recognitions. So with this, 
Uh, the three points are recognize early, say thank you, reward consistency, build your funnel, grow your community, build and empower the network, have actually delegate and distribute this non-code contributions responsibilities through your community, and help it grow. So now I'm gonna talk about the challenges really quickly because I think this is something that it's known by a lot of projects. And this is more like a call to action, so to invite you to start the conversations and help us figure out solutions that can benefit all open source projects. So the first challenge is that there are limitations to what we can see and monitor. And that's why I put like an iceberg. Non-code contributions are often just visible when they are big enough to be like a meetup series or somebody trying to clean up documentation. But it's really impossible to know every single person organizing a meetup about Apache Spark or Apache Beam or Apache Flink if you don't have the connections and the right people looking at it. I'm pretty sure like we don't have everyone in the radar at all times. And the point here is that it can be done if it's done in a community. If you have m people in different regions connecting to your maintainer's community or your, or your core group, and they are looking for different things. So with this, uh, there are a few projects that are trying to do this. A few of them are Apache Kibble, uh, the Cows Project, and Viterhia, who are companies trying to crack this puzzle on how do we build metrics around open source project, and one line in particular is how do we recognize non-code contributions? How do we put the signals and the measurement to, to measure things like events that are mostly done offline, or trainings which are also built offline, or translations which several people decide to do on their own, and they are not connected to, the, to your project. So with that, I'm just gonna share two quick stories because I wanna give time for questions, and they're about the Apache Beam story. So Apache Beam non-code non committers. So in 2016, when we started, there was only one non-code committer, and that person was dedicated to do training. And af like shortly after, uh, we decided to add two more committers, and those two commi I was one of those two committers. I was a second non-code non committer for Beam. And the impact that we had was that the community events and advocacy spread to different regions. So now uh, we are going to be having summits in Europe and in Asia, and we came from only having meetups in the States. And the node code contributions uh, that we recognized for these node uh, code committers were advocacy, documentation, training, and events. And the second story is the Apache Beam Summit. So the Apache Beam Summit was primarily sponsored by a commercial vendor, which was Google. And this year we moved to actually create the event to a, a community event. So there's actually a, a steering committee or organizer committees that it's pretty much the community uh, with representatives organizing the content, the venue, the sponsors. And the impact that we had is that we have bigger events, better content, and we have presence in new regions. And the non code contributions that we are recognizing is, again, event management, content curation, and fundraising. Something that we will see is that it's really inspiring to have moved from one single uh, commercial vendor backing it up to now have several companies actually supporting the event. So, with that, the recap is that no code contributions are value by providing development and sustainability to your project, and also by boosting the ecosystem growth for all the companies or all the individuals playing in open source. And you can foster them by recognizing and awarding the people doing the, the contributions, and also relying in your community to spot them and keep them in the radar. So with that, uh, we have five minutes for questions. Uh, this is my contact information if you want to continue a conversation. And I would also like to invite you to join the diversity at Apache uh, list because uh, NOCA contributions are an important conversation we want to, to have there. So yeah, now questions. Uh, put your hand up if you have a question. Um, so, 
I'm, I'm most familiar with the Lucene community, and the Lucene community has a tremendous number of code committers. To the extent where I think we maybe have one or two non-code committers, so we don't, I would say we have a very unhealthy situation now. We, we don't have a bunch of non-code committers. We don't really do a good job recognizing them. There's no process to encourage them to join Lucene because it's so heavily affected by the committers who are, and contributors who are contributing source code. So what would you recommend for the Lucene community to try to correct that course? So that's actually, I'm gonna recommend the approach that we took in Apache Beam because actually having known code committers wasn't like an obvious choice. How we decided to do it was improving something beyond the code for the community, and that was adoption. And adoption by not only the commercial vendors supporting the project, but also more partners in becoming committers. And we knew that just by doing this, it's not like it wasn't gonna come from the people building the technology. We needed to find community partners, and we're not. So the concrete recommendation will be think about something that you want to improve, and this could be like brand recognition, or maybe presence in a different region. I will say like if you want to bring a project to a different region where you know that you can explore further, it could be. I, I'm not very familiar with Lucene, but if you can, if you want to go, for example, to like Europe or Asia, you can look for community partners there and help them get involved in the project. And by doing that, recognizing them, they will involve the people working with them. And I think it will become like a snowball effect. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk, it was really great. Um, we've been organizing a data engineering meetup here in Berlin for some time now, uh, but it's like more on a general scale um, and not specifically for, for like one specific open source community. So I, I was wondering where do you see in general the, the value of like more general group of interest meetups, which might be like the seed for something bigger later on. So, so let me see if I, I got the gist of the question. So you're asking like, what is the area where these general groups, like general technology groups can add to the projects? Or? How can a, a general group help uh, specific communities grow? Yeah. Yes. So I was actually having a conversation with someone at lunch about this. There are projects um, that seem themselves in that like project life cycle point where they want to grow adoption. So when they're actively looking to grow adoption or awareness, brand awareness, having these hubs of like general technology, like big data groups or a specific area of technology, it's like a good platform to bring the message and reach users who weren't even aware of them. Some projects take a very proactive approach of people will, will find us because we resolve this use case or we are good for this use case and they stay just within those realms. But when you want to expand to a different industry or different like set of users, these type of groups are good because that bring brand awareness just by entering new channels or new hubs. So I think like those are the groups that we actually look for them. Uh, for, uh, for Apache Beam, especially at the beginning, and we're going to talk about that at the summit, which is happening after Berlin Buzzwords, we're going to talk about how the, um, the summit actually became like, bigger. It was because we were looking for these groups to bring awareness from different people trying to solve uh, use cases that were very particular, and we found them through general uh, technology groups and meetups. We can probably sneak one more question in. I'm going to abuse my power. Um, <laughs> so I help out with a lot of boot camps. Uh, these are usually people that want to get into technology. They're maybe even a few steps ahead of being an NCC contributor. And I, I think this is the type of community that would be really great to help them get more exposure. Yeah. What are good projects or, or ways for them to even find this? Because if you think back to your big picture, um, like for these people, this whole world is incredibly daunting. So you're meaning like the contributors, how to find the sponsor or like people who recognize them and make them part of the community? Even projects, yeah, projects that it's kind of easy to get into. So like for Lucene, for example, I, that would be super hard for boot camp level people to get involved in, but maybe there's something that's more friendly. I see. So I think like for them, we're actually also exploring how to, to grow representation of underrepresented groups in projects, and we're thinking about exactly doing this. 
I will say that just matching them up with communities that are a little bit more open and or, or more aware of like growing to different spaces or actually going to new areas is the easiest, more obvious way. And just helping them bring what they the context that they have. Like for example, if they are part of like the Latin community again and they want to translate a project into Spanish, that is something that it's very obvious. And one of the reasons why I put the two type of values that non contributions provide, like the money and the, the market size and the development stability and time, is so they can also help the project see this. If by a contribution of documentation, they can reduce the number of JIRA issues or tickets reported to a top user issue, they can demonstrate the value. That's a way for them to build their, their career or their path into the project. So find the specializations based on what they provide to the project. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's all we have time for. So a big round of applause for Giselle. Thank you.